Hello, my name is Sin Bagley, and I'm reading The Skylark of Space by E.E. E. Doc Smith in collaboration with Lee Hawkins Garby, Chapter 6. The Object Compass at Work Prescott, after a sleepless night, joined Seton and Crane at breakfast. What do you make of it, Mr. Prescott? asked Crane. Seton here thinks it was Duchesne, possibly acting for some foreign power, after our flying machine to use in war. I think it was some big industrial concern after our power plant. What is your opinion? I haven't any, replied the great detective after a moment. Either guess may be true, although I am almost positive that Dr. Duchesne had nothing to do with it either way. It was no ordinary burglary. That is certain from Shiro's story. It was done by someone who had exact information of your movements and habits. He chose a time when you were away, probably not so much from fear of you, as because it was only in your absence that he could succeed as he did in getting all the guards out at once, where he could handle them. He was a man with one accomplice, or who worked alone, and who was almost exactly Seaton's size and build. He was undoubtedly an expert. As he blew the safe and searched the whole house without leaving a fingerprint or any other clue, however slight that I can find, a thing I have never before seen before in my experience. His size should help in locating him, declared Crane. Well, there are undoubtedly thousands of men of Dick's six foot one and two fifths. They are fairly scattered, are they not? Yes, they are, but in his very size only makes it worse. I have gone over all records I could in the short time I've had, and I can't find an expert of that class anywhere near that description. How about the third guard, the one who escaped? asked Seaton. He wasn't here. It was afternoon it was his afternoon off, you know, and he said that he wouldn't come back with this on into this job on a bet, that he wasn't afraid of anything ordinary, but he didn't like the looks of things out here. That sounded fishy to me, and I fired him. He may have been the leak, of course, though I've always found him reliable before. If he did leak, it must have got a whale of a slice for it. He is under constant watch, and if we can ever get anything on him, I will nail him to the cross, but that doesn't help get this affair straightened out. I haven't given up, of course. There are lots of things not t tried yet, but I must admit that temporarily, at least, I am up a stump. Well, remarked Seaton, that million-dollar reward will bring him in, sure. No honor that ever existed among thieves or even among freelancers of diplomacy could stand that strain. I'm not sure of that, Dick, said Crane. If either of our ideas is the right one, very few men would have enough, know enough about the affair to get a permanent information, and they probably would not live long enough to enjoy the reward very thoroughly. Even a million-dollar fails in this case. I rather agree with Mr. Crane Seaton. If it were an ordinary affair, and I'm sure it is not, as a policer that it is, a reward of that size would give us our man within two days. As it is, I doubt very much that the reward will do us any good. I'm afraid that it will never be claimed. I wonder if the Secret Service would help us out. They'd be interested if it should turn out to be some foreign power. I took it up with the chief himself just after it happened last night. He doesn't think that it can be a foreign country. He has their agents pretty well spotted, and the only one that could fill the bill, you know, a man with a description with a cold nerve to do the job, would be apt to be known, was in San Francisco the time this job was pulled off. The more you talk, the more I'm convinced that it was Duchesne himself, declared Seaton, positively. He is almost exactly my size and build, and is the only man I know of who could do anything with a solution after he got it, and he has nerve enough to do anything. I would like to think it was Duchesne, replied the detective thoughtfully, but I'm afraid we'll have to count him out of it entirely. He's been under the constant surveillance of my best men ever since you mentioned him. We have dectaphones in his rooms, wires in his telephone, and are watching him night and day. He never goes out except to work, never has any except unimportant telephone calls, and the instruments register only the occasional scratching of a match, the rustle of papers, and other noises of a man studying. He's innocent. That may be true, assented Seaton doubtfully, but you want to remember that he knows more about electricity than the guy that invented it, and I'm not sure that he can't talk to a dectaphone and make it say anything he wants it to. Anyway, we can soon settle it. Yesterday I made a special trip down to the bureau and with some notes as an excuse to set this object compass on him. Taking one of the small instruments from his pocket as he spoke, 
I watched him a while last night and then fixed an alarm to wake me up if the needle moved much, but it pointed steady all night. See, it's moving now. That means that he's going to work early as usual. Now, I'm morally certain that he's mixed up in this thing somewhere, and I'm not convinced that he isn't slipping out one over on your men in some way. He's a clever devil. I wonder if you wouldn't take this compass and watch him yourself tonight, just on general principles. Or let me do it. I'd be glad to. I say tonight, because if he did get the stuff he here, he didn't deliver it anywhere last night. It's just a chance, of course, but he may do it tonight. After the compass had been explained to the detective, he gladly consented to the plan, declaring that he would willingly spend the time just to watch such an unheard-of instrument work. After another hour of fruitless discussion, Prescott took his leave, saying that he would mount an impregnable guard from that time on. Later that evening, Prescott joined the two men who were watching Duchesne's house. They reported that all was perfectly quiet, as usual. The scientist was in his library, the reg instruments registering only the occasional faint sounds of a man absorbed in study. But after an hour of waiting, and while the microphones made a swaying noise as if of rustling papers, the needle of the compass moved. It dipped slowly toward the earth, as though Duchesne was descending into the cellar. At the same time, the shadow of his unmistakable profile was thrown upon the window, shade as he apparently crossed the room. Can you hear him walk? demanded Prescott. No, he has heavy Turkish rugs all over the library, and he always walks very lightly besides. Prescott watched the needle in amazement as it dipped deeper and deeper, pointing down into the earth almost under the, his feet and then behind him, as though Duchesne had walked beneath him. He did not, could not believe it. He was certain that something had gone wrong with a strange instrument in his hand. Nevertheless, he followed the pointing needle. It led him beside the park road down the hill, straight toward the long bridge which forms one entrance to Rock Creek Park. Though skeptical, Prescott took no chances, and as he approached the bridge, he left the road and concealed himself behind a clump of trees, from which point of vantage he could see the ground beneath the bridge as well as the roadway. Soon the bridge trembled under the weight of a heavy automobile going toward the city at the high rate of speed. He saw Duchesne with a roll of papers under his arm emerge from under the bridge just in time to leap aboard the automobile, which slowed down only enough to enable him to board it in safety. The detective noticed that the car was a Pierce Arrow limousine, a car not common even in Washington, and rushed out to get its number, but the license plates were so smeared with oil and dust that the numbers could not be read by the light of the tail lamp. Glancing at the compass in his hand, he saw that the delicate needle was now pointing steadily at the fleeing car, and all doubts as to the power of the instrument were dispelled. He rejoined his men, informed them that Duchesne had eluded them, and took the, one of them up the hill to a nearby garage. Then he engaged a fast car and set out in pursuit, choosing the path for the chauffeur by means of the compass. His search ended at the residence of Brookings, the general manager of the Great World Steel Corporation. Here he dismissed the car and watched the house while his assistant went to bring out the fast motorcycle used by Prescott when high speed was desirable. After four hours, a small car bearing the license plate number of a distant state, which was found by subsequent telegraphing to be unknown to the authorities of that state, drove under the port cochet, and the hidden watcher saw Duchesne without the papers step into it. Knowing now what to expect, Prescott drove his car racing motorcycle at full speed out to the Park Road Bridge and concealed himself beneath its structure. In a position commanding a view of the concrete abutment through which the scientist must have come, soon he heard a car slow down overhead, heard a few rapid footfall, footfalls, and saw the dark form of a large man outlined against the gray face of the abutment. He saw the man lift his hand high above his head and saw the black rectangle appear in the gray engulf the man and disappear. After a few minutes, he approached the abutment and searched its face with the help of his flashlight. He finally succeeded in tracing the most imperceptible crack which outlined the door and the concealed button which Duchesne had pressed to open it. He did not press the button as it might be connected to an alarm. Deep in thought, he mounted his motorcycle and made his way to his home to get a few hours of sleep before reporting to Crane, whom he was scheduled to see at breakfast the next morning. Both men were waiting for him when he appeared, 
and he noticed with pleasure that Shiro, with a heavily bandaged hand, was insisting that he was perfectly able to wait on the table instead of breakfasting in bed. He calmly proceeded to serve breakfast in spite of Crane's rem remonstrations, having ceremoniously ordered out of the kitchen the colored man who had been secured to take his place. Well, gentlemen, the detective began, part of the mystery is straightened out. I was entirely wrong, and each of you were partly right. It was Duchesne in all prob probability. It is equally probable that a great company, in this case the World Steel Corporation, is backing him, though I don't believe there is a ghost of a show of ever being able to prove it in law. Your object compass did the trick. He n narrated all the events of the previous night. I'd like to send him to the chair for this job, said Seaton with rising anger. We ought to shoot him anyway, damn him. I'm sorry duels have gone out of fashion, for I can't shoot him offhand the way things are now. I sure wish I could. No, you cannot shoot him, said Crane thoughtfully, and neither can I. Worse luck, we are not in his class there, and you must not fight with him either, noting that Seaton's powerful hands had doubled into fists, the knuckles showing white through the tan skin. Though that would be a fight worth watching, and I would like to see you give him a beating of his life. A little thing like beating, a beating is not a fraction of what he deserves, and it would show him that we have found him out. No, we must do it legally or let him entirely alone. You think there's no hope of proving it, Prescott? Frankly, I see very little chance of it. There's always hope, of course, and if that bunch of pirates ever makes a slip, we'll be right there waiting to catch him. Well, I don't believe in holding out false encouragement. They've never slipped yet. I'll take my men off to Shane now that we've linked him up with Steele. It doesn't make any difference, does it, whether he goes to them every night or only once a week? No. Then about all we can do is to get everything I can on that Steele crowd, and that is very much like trying to get blood out of a turnip. I intend to keep after them, of course, for I owe them something for killing two of my men here, as well as for other favors they have done me in the past. But don't expect too much. I've tackled them before, and so have police headquarters, and even the Secret Service itself, undercover, and all that any of us has been able to get is an occasional small fish. We could never land the big fellows. In fact, we have never found the slightest material proof of what we are morally certain is the truth, that World Steel is back of a lot of deviltry all over the country. The little guys who do the work either don't know anything or are afraid to tell. I'll see if I can find out, but they are doing with the stuff they stole, but I'm not even sure of doing that. You can't plant instruments on that bunch. It would be like trying to stick a pin into a sleeping cat without waking him up. They probably have one of the best corps of detectives in the world. You haven't perfected an instrument which enables you to see into a closed room and hear what was going on then, have you? And upon being assured that they had not, he took his leave. Optimist of cuss, ain't he? remarked Seaton. He has to be, Dick. World Steel is a soulless corporation if there ever was one. They have the shrewdest lawyers in the country and they get away legally with things that are flagrantly illegal, such as freezing out competitors, stealing patents, and the like. Report has it that they do not stop at orison, treason, or murder to attain their ends, but as Prescott said, they never leave any legal proof behind them. Well, we should fret anyway. Of course, a monopoly is what they're after, but they can't form one because they can't possibly get the rest of our solution. Even if they could get it, we can get more. It won't be as easy as this last batch was, since the X was undoubtedly present in some particular lot of platinum in extraordinary quantities. But now that I know exactly what to look for, I can find more. So they can't get their monopoly unless they kill us off. Exactly. Go on, I see you're getting the idea. If we should both conveniently die, they would get the solution from the company and have the monopoly since no one else can handle it. But they couldn't get away with it, Mart. Never in a thousand years, even if they wanted to. Of course I am small fry, but you're too big a man for even steel to do away with. It can't be done. I'm not so sure of that. Airplane accidents are numerous, and I am an aviator. Also, has it ever occurred to you that the heavy forging for the Skylark ordered a long while ago are of steel? Satan paused, dumbfounded in the act of lighting his pipe. But thanks to your object compass, we are warned. Crane continued evenly. 
Those forgings are going through the most complete set of tests known to the industry, and if they go into the Skylark at, at all, it will be after I am thoroughly convinced that they will not give way on our first trip into space. But we can do nothing until the steel arrives, and with the guard Prescott has here, now we are safe enough. Luckily, the enemy knows nothing of the object compass or the explosive, and we must keep them in ignorance. Hereafter, not even the guards get a look at anything we do. They sure don't. Let's get busy. Duchesne and Brookings met in a conference in a private room of the Perkins Cafe. What's a good word, doctor? So-so, replied the scientist. The stuff is all they said it was, but we haven't enough of it to build much of a power plant. We can't go ahead with it anyway, as long as Seton and Crane have nearly all their original solution. No, we can't. We must find a way of getting it. I see now that we should have done as you suggested and taken it before they had warning and put it out of our reach. There's no use holding posts, Martins. We've got to get it some way, and everybody that knows anything about that new metal, how to get it or how to handle it, must die. At first, it would have been enough to kill Seton. Now, however, there's no doubt that Crane knows all about it, and he probably has left complete instructions in case he gets killed in an accident. He's that kind that would. We'll have to keep our eyes open and wipe out those instructions and anyone who has seen them. You see that, don't you? Yes, I'm afraid that the only way out, we must have the monopoly. And anyone who might be able to interfere with it must be removed. How's your search for more X prospered? About as well as I expected. We bought up all the platinum waste we could get and reworked all the metallic platinum and allied metals we could buy in the open market and yet got less than a gram of X out of the whole lot. And scarcer than radium. Seton's finding so much of it at once was an accident, pure and simple. It couldn't happen once in a million years. Well, have you any suggestions to how we can get the solution? No, I haven't thought of anything but that very th thing ever since I found that they had hidden it, and I can't see any good way of getting it. My forte is direct action, and that fails in this case, since no amount of force or torture could make Crane reveal the hiding place of the solution. It's probably in the safest safe deposit vault in the country. He wouldn't carry the key on him. Probably wouldn't have it in the house. Killing Seton or Crane or both of them is easy enough, but it probably wouldn't get us a solution, as I have no doubt that Crane has provided for everything. Probably he has, but if he should disappear, the stuff would have to come to light, or the Seton Crane Company might start their power plant. In that case, we probably could get it. Possibly, you mean. The method is too slow to suit me, though. It would take months, maybe years, and would be devilishly uncertain to boot. They'll know something is in the wind, and the stuff will be surrounded by every safeguard they can think of. There must be some better way that, but I haven't been able to think of it. Neither have I. But your phrase, direct action, gives me an idea. You see that the method has failed. What do you think of trying indirect action in the shape of Perkins, who is indirection personified? Bring him in. He may be able to figure out something. Perkins was called in, and the main phases of the situation laid bare before him. The three, three men sat in silence for many minutes while the crafty strategist studied the problem. Finally, he spoke. There's only one way, gentlemen. We must get a handle on either Seton or Crane strong enough to make them give up their bottle of dope, their plans, and everything. Handle, interrupted Duchesne. You talk like a fool. You can't get anything on either of them. You misunderstand me, doctor. You can get a handle of some kind on any living man, but not necessarily in his past, you understand. I know that anything like that is out of the question in this case, but in his future, with some men it is money, with others power, with others fame, with others women, or some woman, and so on down the list. What can we use here? Money's out of the question. So are power and fame, as they already have both in plain sight. It seems to me that women would be our best chance. Ha! snorted the chemist. Crane has been chased by all the women of the three continents so long that he's women-proof. Seton is worse. He's engaged and wouldn't realize that a woman was on his trail, even if he could find a better-looking one to work on him than the girl he's engaged to, which would be a hard job. Cleopatra herself couldn't swing that order. Engaged? That makes it simple as ABC. Simple? 
In the devil's name, how? Easy as falling off a log. You have enough of the dope to build a space car from those plans, haven't you? Yes. What does that to do with the case? It has everything to do with it. I would suggest that we build such a car and use it to carry off the girl. After we drive her, have her safe, we can tell Seton that he, she is marooned on some distant planet and that she will be returned on Earth only after the solution. All knows plans and everything pertaining to the new metal are surrendered. That will bring him and Crane with consent. Then afterward, Dr. Seton may go away indefinitely, and if desirable, Mr. Crane may accompany him. But suppose they try to fight, asked Brookings. Perkins slid down into his chair in deep thought, his pale eyes under his half-closed lids darting here and there, his stubby fingers whirring, his watch chain restlessly. Who is the girl? he asked at last. Dorothy Vainman, the daughter of the lawyer. She's that auburn-haired beauty that the papers were so full of when she came out last year. Vainman is a director in the Seton Crane Company. That makes it still better. If they show fight and follow us, that beautiful car we are making for them will collapse and they will be out of the way. Vainman, as a Seton's prospective father-in-law and a member of his company, probably knows something about the secret. Maybe all of it. With his daughter in a space car supposedly out in space and Seton and Crane out of the way, Vainman would listen to reason and let go of the solution, particularly as nobody knows much about it except Seton and Crane. That strikes me as a perfectly reasonable plan, said Brookings, but you haven't really ta but you wouldn't really take her to another planet, would you? Why not use an automobile or an airplane and tell Seton that it was a space car? Hmm. <clears throat> I wouldn't advise that. He might not believe it, and they might make a lot of trouble. It must be a real space car, even if we don't take her out of the city. To make it more impressive, you should take her in plain sight of Seton. No, that would be too dangerous, as I found out from the police that Seton has a permit to carry arms. And I know he's one of the fastest men with a pistol in the whole country. Do it in plain sight of her folks. Say, or a crowd of people being masked, of course, or dressed in, in an aviator suit with a hood and goggles on. Take her straight up out of sight, then hide her somewhere until Seton listens to reason. I know that he will listen, but if he doesn't, you might let him see you start out to visit her. He'll be sure to follow you in that rotten car. As soon as he does that, he's our mate. But that raises the question of who is going to drive the car. I am, replied Duchesne. I'll need some help, though, as at least one man must stay with the girl while I bring back the car. We won't. We don't want to let anybody else on this if we can help it, cautioned Brookings. You could go along, couldn't you, Perkins? Is it safe? Absolutely, answered Duchesne. They have everything worked out to the Queen's taste. That's all right, then. I'll take the trip. Also, turning to Brookings, it will help, too, in another little thing we are doing, the Spencer Affair. Haven't you got that stuff away from her yet after having had her locked up in that hell hole for two months? asked Brookings. No. She's stubborn as a mule. We've given her the third degree time after time, but it's no use. What's this, asked Duchesne, devil tree in the main office? Yes, this Margaret Spencer claims that we swindled her father out of an invention and indirectly caused his death. She secured a position with us in search of evidence. She's an expert stenographer and showed such ability that she was promoted until she became my secretary. Our detectives must have been asleep as she made away, away with some photographs and drawings before they caught her. She has no real evidence, of course, but she might cause trouble with a jury, especially if she's one of the best-looking women in Washington. Perkins is holding her until she returns the stolen articles. Why can't you kill her off? She cannot be disposed of until we know where the stuff is because she says, and Perkins believes, that the evidence will show up in her effects. There must be something about her soon as the search for her is dying down and she will be given up for dead. What's the idea about her and the space car? If the car proves were reliable, we might actually take her out into space and give her the choice between telling and walking back. She has nerve enough here on Earth to die before giving up, but I don't believe any human being would be game to go it alone on a strange world. She'd wilt. I believe you're right, Perkins. Your suggestions are the best way out, don't you think, Doctor? Yes, I don't see how we can fail. We're sure to win either way. You are prepared for trouble afterward, of course. Certainly. 
but I don't think there'll be much trouble. They can't possibly link the three of us together. They aren't wise to you, are they, Doctor? Not a chance, sneered Duchesne. They ran themselves ragged trying to get something on me, but they couldn't do it. They have given me up as a bad job. I'm still as careful as ever, though. I am merely a pure scientist in the Bureau of Chemistry. All three laughed and Perkins left the room. The talk then turned to the construction of the space car. It was decided to rush the work on it so that Duchesne could familiarize himself with its operation, but not to take any steps in the actual abduction until such time as Seaton and Crane were nearly ready to take their first flight, so that they could pursue the abductors in case Seaton was still abdurant. Abdurate, after two few after a few days of his fiancée's absence. Duchesne insisted that the car should mount a couple of heavy guns to destroy the pursuing car if the faulty members should happen to hold together long enough to carry it in, out into space. After a long discussion in which every detail of the plan was carefully considered, the two men left the restaurant by different exits. And that's the end of chapter 6.